Tonight I want to talk about our most recent book. It's a book that I did with my wife, Stephanie Whittlesey. It's called Prehistory, Personality, and Place, Emil W. Howery and the Mugione Controversy. I want to read from the back because it describes it fairly well. When Emil Howery defined the ancient Mugione in the 1930s, as a culture distinct from the ancestral Pueblo and Hohokam neighbors, he triggered a major intellectual controversy in the history of Southwestern archeology. span The controversy centered on whether the Mugion were truly a different culture or merely a backwoods variant of a better known people such as the ancestral Pueblo. And what I want to do tonight is to talk about the making of this book, which took 35 years. And look how thin it is. And you can get a copy out front for $15. That's $5 less than the U of A press. 35 years, and I realize that, that that is half of my lifetime here. So that the making of this book is a very important component of tonight's presentation. So I want to divide it into two parts, the making of the book, which I did with my wife, Stephanie Whittlesey, and then talk about the controversy. First, the making of the book. In 1975, I was much younger. Perhaps some of you were too. I spent every Thursday night for a spring semester, very much like this, doing an oral history with Emil Howery. I went to his house with one of those big reel-to-reel -reel tape recorders. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is the early days. It was an outstanding machine, though. And we would sit there and we would drink, and I knew I would be able to outdrink him because I was young. I was 37 years younger than I am now. But he was, he was actually making the drinks, and I should have suspected. But I knew that I would be able to break him open and get some good gossip about the history of Southwestern archeology. span So I tell people, not a chance. He said two things that might have been considered negative. One, Harold Gladwin was capricious. <laughs> Such a strong word. Two, Florence Holly Ellis's first husband, Donovan Center, was a horse's ass. <laughs> That's it. All of those nights, all of that time, all of that oral tradition and did not crack him once. He did not talk about his personal life, did not talk about other people, did not spread gossip, but we had a full transcription of his autobiography, which I hope will be worked up more by his son, Lauren and maybe grandson. I was planning to work on the Mugion, planning to work on the Mugion, but during the 80s and some of the 90s, I got embroiled in a controversy of my own, a debate which we now call the Grasshopper Chavez Pass debate. And it pitted U of A against ASU or me against Fred Plogg and we debated back and forth. Eventually, I have to confess, I think Grasshopper lost. And what I realized was that we lost because I did not have the power, maybe the personality too, did not have the power that Fred Plogg had. So power was a very important component. So when we were thinking about this book, it was originally titled Prehistory, Personality, and Power. And the first draft tried to deal with power, tried to measure power, tried to talk about it, because I knew Emil had the power in order to 
solve the controversy? Well, power is hard to measure. It's very difficult to measure, and it didn't really make a very good story. And I think it was probably Stephanie who turned my attention toward place, landscape, a sense of place, place being very important. So we went from power to place, and that is how the narrative is played out. We look at the controversy in terms of places, different places, different kinds of places, a progression of places. So that's why we call it prehistory personality still, but place. But a subtext or a light motif there is still power. But it's not something that we could use in order to drive the narrative. So I had to give up on power, even though I knew in our Grasshopper Chavez past debate, power was the dominant factor. But not in the Mugion controversy. Power was only one of many different characteristics or factors. Place was more important, and it's a more interesting narrative, I think. So, what did we do? We went to Newton, Kansas. We went to Bethel College. We went to the museum. We traveled around. We got a sense of place. Kansas, any of you from Kansas? <laughs> Kansas has USGS maps with two contour lines. <laughs> it is totally flat. It is unbelievably flat. Incredibly flat. And there in the middle of that flat plain was Bethel College, Newton, uh, a Mennonite school. And we went to the museum and we looked at archives and looked at a variety of family documents and came away with a certain sense of a Kansas environment landscape occupied by Mennonite farmers, which we think was an important ingredient, an important foundation. But I'm going to skip very quickly to the fact that Emil left Kansas, as a lot of people have done, I can understand why. <laughs> Went first to Coquilco, Mexico City, then came to Tucson. Finished his BA here at Tucson under Byron Cummings. Got his MA here, Tucson, under Byron Cummings. Remember, there were three, three MAs in 1928. Emil Howery, Clara Lee Fraps, Florence Holly. So you say the first three MAs included two-thirds female. <laughs> Amo taught here for the next year, but he did not like being an instructor to people that he was a student with the year before. So then he was lucky enough to get a job with A.E. Douglas. Now, how lucky would that be? So not only did he study under Cummings, he worked with Douglas and in 1930, he went to work under Harold Gladwin at the Gila Pueblo Archaeological Foundation. Three brilliant individuals were an important component of his education, his training. And of course, you realize that he went and received his PhD from Harvard in 1934. But let's, let's go back. <clears throat> In 1927, he was a driver for Byron Cummings, then president of the University of Arizona. It's the only president we've had who was an archaeologist. We need more. They know how to run things. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like George W. Bush. <clears throat> <laughs> he was the driver, and he was there with Clara Lee Fraps. You know it's Clara Lee Fraps Tanner. Florence Holly was not allowed to go by her mother, who thought that she was inappropriately chaperoned. But in 1927, the Pecos Conference was a signal conference held by A.V. Kidder to define Basket Maker Pueblo. So in 27, Basket Maker Pueblo is defined. 
1931, Emil, working out of Gila Pueblo, excavated the whole calm colonial site of Roosevelt 96. So he then had what the Anasazi looked like during, say, Pueblo II period. The whole calm looked like during the comparable colonial period. They had a Gila Pueblo conference in April of 31 to deal with the fact that below the rim, the Pecos classification did not work. Well, that never went anywhere, except during the summer. The summer of 1931 was a signal event in the sense that Emil and Russell Hastings traveled throughout the mountains of East Central Arizona, Western New Mexico, and they found a consistent association of brown plain pottery and pit houses in villages. This was the Forest Dale up into the Sholo area, over to the reserve, down to the Membris, and this allowed them to speculate on what was something different, because it was not Anasazi, Ancestral Pueblo, it was not Hohokam, it was something else. In 1934, as I said, he finished his PhD at Harvard. That uh, summer he went to excavate. The previous summer, in 33, he had excavated Mugion Village. In 34, he excavated the Harris Village. Those two excavations in New Mexico allowed him in 1936 to publish the monograph, The Mugion Culture of Southwestern New Mexico. That's what defined the Mugion culture. That's what started the controversy. I might also mention, I like to tell grad students this, that uh, finished a dissertation in 34, excavated Harris Village in the summer of 34, led the Snake Town excavation in the winter of 34, 35. It was busy. In 1936, this medallion paper defined the Mugion culture, and it created a schism among Southwestern archaeologists immediately. There were proponents, Paul Martin, Eric Reed, Eric Reed who had worked with him at the Harris site and at Snake Town, 1934-35. There were others, John Rinaldo, and then there were opponents, particularly the most prominent ancestral Pueblo archaeologist of the time, John Otis Brew, Joe Brew of the Peabody Museum, Harvard. So in effect, Howery was taking on a Harvard establishment and that is how the controversy was driven for at least 20 years. And in some cases, it kind of trickled on even after it was kind of resolved 20 years later. In 1939, after Howard had left Globe, Arizona, and come to Tucson to head both the Department of Archaeology, which he changed to Anthropology, and also be director of the Arizona State Museum. He embarked on two projects, one the Papagoria project, but one summer project in the Forestdale Valley. No sensible person works in Tucson outside during the summer. <laughs> you get to at least 6,000 feet. So that's where he had his first field school. He did that because Earl Morris, a bona fide ancestral Pueblo archaeologist could not come down and do the digging there that was necessary to support the Mugion proposition or concept. So Howard took the field school there. So they were there 39, 40, 41, and you may know what happened in December of 1941, and the field school did not continue there, although he did some work there. And there, he demonstrated through excavations at two sites another data point in the distribution of plainware ceramics and pit house villages. 
the Bear site. So the Bear was equivalent to Harris and Mugion Village, solid excavations that were in different parts of the mountain domain. And he also dug the bluff site, and from the bluff site, he got early tree ring dates. So not only did he have some information on authenticity or separateness, he also had information on antiquity. He had tree ring dates with plainware pottery that were unequivocally around A.D. 300. Uh, when he published that, he originally had a grad student look at it and analyze it. When he realized the significance of those dates, he had A.E. Douglas <laughs> look at them. And it was A.E. Douglas who actually authored the little report on the tree ring dates from the bluff site. So by this time, by the mid-40s, he had solid evidence for authenticity, separateness, and antiquity, which was ceramics prior to ancestral Pueblo. They did not like this. They did not like it at all. Grad students at Harvard, specifically Fred Windorf, wrote in his dissertation the fact that there was this schism, there was this controversy between a number of people who had aligned themselves with J.O. Brew and those who had aligned themselves with Emil Howery. Also in 1939, Paul S. Martin and John Ronaldo go to the Pine Lawn region of West Central New Mexico based on the survey data that Howery and Hastings had compiled in 31. And Martin and Ronaldo excavated and published through Fieldiana outside of the Field Museum an amazing series of site reports. They presented data every year after their excavation so that it was very difficult for archaeologists at that time to counter what was becoming an overwhelming tsunami, overwhelming mountain of data. And again, data were very important in those days. So what Harry had demonstrated, <laughs> did I say something wrong? I'm not running for office. <clears throat> yeah, facts were very important in those days. <clears throat> Not only were facts important, it was the presentation of facts in site reports that was very important. And excavations rather than simple surveys. Surveys had been done. And those excavations demonstrated that there was a widespread distribution of this phenomenon. So we have what Harry had done at Forestdale, what Martin and Ronaldo were doing in the Pine Lawn Valley, mounting all of this data in order to present the argument, but still the detractors were not believers. Why do you think that was? Well, they had vested interests, of course, I think. There may have been other characteristics as well. In those days, in order to convince your colleagues, you brought them to the field. Well, you didn't have as many colleagues, you could do that. I call that the acapella form uh, <laughs> verification. So Harry had the first Pecos conference outside of New Mexico at Point of Pines. Remember he had moved the field school to Point of Pines in 1946 with that in 1960. But in 1948 he had the first Pecos conference outside of New Mexico at Point of Pines in order to demonstrate what Mugion looked like in the dirt. That's what you did. That's how you convinced colleagues. Joe Brew was there. There's a story that someone created out of a basketball, a soccer ball, an eight ball, and put that in front of Joe Brew when he was at the panel. We have no photographs of that eight ball. 
But there was a panel to discuss the Mogollon at Point of Pines, Pecos Conference. And they went into the field to look at a particular site being excavated by Joe Ben Wheat. Crooked Ridge, Crooked Ridge Village was shown to all the participants who made it to the middle of nowhere then. The Mogollon looked like in reality. And they hassled back and forth, and we have some of that discussion in our book because Joe Ben Wheat's wife was an accomplished stenographer and took down the notes. Those notes are in the Laboratory of Anthropology in Santa Fe. They still weren't convinced. Howry went ahead and had another Pecos conference at Point of Pines in 1951. But that conference addressed Eric Reed's notion of the Mogollon existing into the Pueblo period. But where the power comes in, I think, is how Howry used grad students. Joe Ben Wheat. Recall Joe Ben Wheat and Charles de Peso were the first two PhDs from our program. De Peso was number one because D comes before W in the alphabet. But that was 1953. 1953, they both received their PhDs. Wheat's PhD was a site report on Crooked Ridge Village and also a synthesis of everything that was known about Mogollon culture prior to A.D. 1000. Now here's the trick, here's the power that Emil drew upon. Joe Ben Wheat's summary of his dissertation on the Mogollon was published in 54 as part of an American anthropologist volume devoted to the Southwest sent to everybody who was a member. In 55, it was published as a memoir both of the Society for American Archaeology and also the American Anthropological Association. Not only did everybody get one, some people got two. <laughs> that has never been replicated. So people were inundated with Joe Ben Wheat's Mogollon culture prior to A.D. 1000. Everybody had at least one copy. As I, many people had two. Others who didn't read well, they could get the Reader's Digest version out of American <laughs> Anthropologists. And then the site report was published by the Social Science Bulletin of the University of Arizona. So in effect, what Joe Ben had done was to bring all the data together, and what Emil Howry had done was distribute it throughout the academic community so that we think that by 55, the controversy was resolved. It might not have been resolved if a lot of people had continued to argue. Uh, J.O. Brew became director of the Peabody Museum and was caught up in administration and was worried about getting site reports done for his five years at Awadavi from 35 to 39. But there were Harvard graduate students that still would question the Mogollon concept as late as 1962 with Bill Bullard. What is interesting is that Ned Danson, and this is like the royal families of Europe, Ned Danson was a Harvard PhD who agreed with Howry and of course, Danson's daughter married Harry's son. <laughs> That's how you join the royal families in archaeology. Lauren Howry and Jan Danson. And of course, you know Jan Danson is the sister of Ted Danson, the TV and movie star. But that's a totally different story. That I'm not going into it. They, Jan, Jan and Ted are in the Danson homestead there in Sedona. By 1955, we think the Mogollon controversy had ended. But no sooner had Howry brought an end to that 
than some of his grad students, like Charles de Peso and others, began to question the Hohokam. <laughs> and I'll leave it there. <laughs> Questions? Hey, um, if I could get people to raise their hands, I'll bring the microphone to them. Um, if you don't feel like asking a question out loud, there are pads of pa pa paper and pens. Feel free to write your question down, and I will be happy to read it uh, at a, later, a little later. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I can't remember exactly when Dr. Howry uh, worked on the Cherry Creek cliff dwellings, right? Didn't he publish a volume on the Cherry Creek Cliff dwellings? Of the Sierra Ancha. Canyon yeah, Creek Sierra and the Ancha. cliff I'm sorry. dwellings of the Sierra um, Ancha. So my question is, <clears throat> how do those sites fit into the Mugion concept, and how do they fit into the controversy as far as did he use those to, are those, did he consider those late Mugion? No. No. Okay. Uh, he was most uncomfortable with seeing post-81,000 mountain peoples as Mugion, although he could use the term Mugion Pueblo. He did use, at various times, the term Mugion Pueblo, and we, we quote him as being reasonably comfortable in calling them a Puebloan people, but giving it the prefix of Mugion. But he was never comfortable with calling them strictly Mugion. He saw them as different. And those cliff-dwelling folks, he would not have called Mugion. Our subsequent work, because Canyon Creek is in the Grasshopper region, it's right off the edge of the Grasshopper Plateau, our subsequent work would indicate that people in the mountains in the 1300s were of different ethnic affiliations. So that you probably had ancestral Pueblo people there, like we have at Grasshopper, you had indigenous mountain Mugion, and you had other folks as well. And this is fairly well attested in uh, a number of stu studies in using a variety of data. Next question. Are we stumped? <laughs> Stump the chumps, like, you know, click and clack. <clears throat> so do you follow the, the, that 1000 AD as sort of the border between what what Mogion is and where things completely change or, or change enough for in, it to be a different... In New Mexico. Okay. Along the members, yes, there's a change at 81,000. Uh, you move from pit houses to classic members, general. So you have about 200 years there of members, and everybody, even today, refers to members as Mogion. And as long as there is members, there will be Mogion. Okay, and in Arizona, where do you see the, the boundary between? Uh, it's later, the, say, the change from pit house villages to above ground structures occurs around 1150 or so, depending on where you are. It occurs uh, faster over in the, or earlier, over in the Point of Pines area, close to the New Mexico line. In the Grasshopper area, it's later. It's about 100 years later. So there is some uh, fall off, you might say, mm -hmm. in, in the transition. And there's an incredible amount of variability in the mountains because they are intermediate between the plateau and the desert. So you're getting desert people coming into the mountains, you're getting plateau people coming to the mountains. In effect, you might consider the mountains as a joint use area for a lot of these neighbors. But they also have their distinctive local residents. In our book, we use the current occupants, Apacheans, to model what we think was the pre-Pueblo type adaptation, and then the Hopi, kind of a generalized Hopi model for the Pueblo occupation of the mountains. Okay. Other questions? How do you see this controversy uh, affecting graduate students coming up under each of these 
different regimes. You must, <laughs> you must be a faithful servant. Uh, you must be a, a good acolyte, as, as it were. Uh, and, that, and that still holds true, although um, some of the students here may testify that Dr. Schiffer and myself yearn for the day when we have at least one obsequious fawning graduate student. <laughs> we haven't been able to cultivate one yet. Uh, but before we expire or retire, maybe just one. <laughs> but that, that still is an important component. It was a very important component of uh, debate so that Arizona grad students would debate through theses and dissertations Harvard graduate students. And I don't know how Ned Danson got away with going against his mentor, Joe Brew. Fred Windorf did too. Uh, Bill Bullard didn't. Hiroshi Daifuku did not. Uh, it involves a number of personality characteristics, but it's not uncommon that grad student labor being chattel labor, as it were, <laughs> grad students are here, as you well know, uh, it's cheap, you know, it's below market value, below scale. <laughs> and it also allows you to pretend that uh, I, I had no control. <laughs> Person was a renegade. Question up here? Well, I, I'm not sure I can make this an intelligent question. Um, I'm confused. Um, it, it seems like what you're saying is that everybody wants to categorize or, or label different peoples. And what you're saying, to, what I'm hearing is that the people in the Mogollon or the Gila or whatever are, are from all groups, that they're not just one necessary, are necessarily not one identified group. And also the membranes, I always think about membranes as pottery. I mean, because of the, you know, the different kind of pottery it has. But um, so the difference between Mokian and Membres, and I'm, I'm like, kind of like lost here. People call the Membres Mokian. So as I said earlier, as long as people see Membres as Mokian, there will be Mokian among the doubters, those, those disbelievers. Now. Uh, through time, I think we have larger populations and more mobility, and there are more resources in the mountains so that we get through time later on much more in the way of ethnic mixing. Like, like Tucson. Tucson, say, a hundred and what, let's say, 1870s. Have you ever read George Hand's uh, Saloon Diaries? It's a different Tucson. <laughs> it is totally different. Uh, uh, John Gregory Bork, the adjutant to Crook, he talked about Tucson. It was a different place. <laughs> and that was the 1870s. Uh, it was highly Mexicanized then, uh, before the train in 1880. Since then, uh, the ethnic balance has clearly shifted, you might say. So, uh, depends a lot on factors. In the mountains, it's really around 1300. When a lot of people are leaving the plateau, they're going to the mountains, and other people who had been there hab habitually are going in order to seek shelter, better food. This is the great drought. So that the overall multi-ethnic character is strongest in the mountains in the 1300s. By 1400, there's hardly anybody in the mountains. Nobody's in the mountains on a full-time residential basis. They went someplace else. They went to Hopi, they went to Zuni, Acoma, Laguna, various places on the Rio Grande. And then some moved south. In fact, Howard thought that some of the Mogollon in moving south uh, joined the Tarahumara 
he saw the Tarahumara uh, Sierra, a mountain adaptation very similar to that of the mountain by Guillaume. So in his, in his book on the Forestdale Valley, he, he says that that's, that's a possibility that ought to be investigated. Okay, we have a question from the bar. Um, how would you describe a, a how would you describe the difference in the in the day of a life of someone around 800 AD, uh, one person living in a Mogian Mogian village and one person living in an early uh, ancestral pueblo? 800 AD, ish. That's interesting. I don't think there was a very high population on the Colorado Plateau. I've traveled with Jeff Dean, who is now Mr. Ancestral Pueblo, <laughs> around the Four Corners, and it's clear, if you cannot digest sedimentary rock, you will starve. <laughs> you will absolutely starve to death. It is nothing but sandstone and limestone with isolated pockets that make it possible to subsist in uh, small groups in isolated areas. Uh, I think the spread of corn, I believe corn spread from the south to the north. I agree with R.G. Matson and others, but primarily R.G. That made it possible to survive on something other than little bunnies, little bunnies that you were able to run down. Uh, so that ar around that time, you would be a hard scrabble farmer and you would be waiting for the better agricultural times that start around 8900. So around 800, they're, they're, they're small groups, they're hard scrabble farmers, uh, corn, beans, squash, the occasional bunny. And then there in the mountains, you have many more uh, hunter-gatherer foods so that uh, gardening is not going to produce much more than maybe 25, 30 percent of your diet. That's going to vary depending upon frost-free days and various things like that. You can tell I'm a very sophisticated gardener. <laughs> you ever tried to grow a tomato in Tucson? Oh yeah. We perfected the four dollar tomato seven <laughs> years ago. You've got to fight bunnies and birds. You've got to totally screen it in with what they now call poultry netting. In my day, it was chicken wire. It's now it's poultry netting. But there are a lot of deer. The Mugion were excellent hunters. We can tell by the number of arrowheads that we find associated with them. And the deer bones, and they're going after mule deer. So they are, they are probably eating far more in the way of protein, animal protein. And they also have the bunnies and the squirrels and various animals like that. But you have the bigger, uh, more productive animals such as the mule deer. So they would be largely hunters with some gardening and a fair amount of gathering. And being in the mountains, you're in an ecotonal situation so that you have a mixture of desert and plateau resources and you can easily move down to where the cactus are, or the acorns, or the mesquite beans, various things like that. Okay, another question. Jeff, I was hoping you could say a little bit more about the relationship between Doc Howery and Joe Brew. Um, especially, I guess I wanted to hear, uh, I'm not sure I understood the allusion to the eight ball uh, for or the yeah the eight ball for for Joe Brew at the at the at the uh, Pecos conference, um, you know they knew each other for a long time and you, you suggested they were you know at odds over some things were there things that they agreed about and what was the story was was it was the reference to the eight ball because he could throw a black ball for the Mogollon concert is the old metaphor was? behind the eight ball. Um, he was in a panel of Mugion believers. And so someone put an eight ball in front of him in order to evoke that old metaphor. I don't think it's used anymore, is it? Is it? Behind the eight ball is, you know, in trouble, you know, at risk. Uh, On the spot. 
that's what they tried to in indicate by that. They always handled themselves as gentlemen. Um, and they allowed students, I think, to uh, engage in what ac academic debate, discourse. Now we say conversation. Uh, Joe Brew, however, did attack some Muggion believers. If you're ever sensitive to criticism, read Joe Brew's review of John McGregor's textbook, 1941 Southwest Archaeology. It is probably the roughest review anyone has ever received, colleague to colleague. It's because in that book, John McGregor calls the Mugion a basic culture equivalent to what they were then calling Anasazi, Ancestral Pueblo, and Hohokam. Joe Bruce stomped on it. Um, that ought to be, I think, read by everyone to see exactly how incredibly harsh these various reviews can, can be. But between the two of them, no. I find no indication that there was any animosity between the two of them. I think they agreed to disagree. And the overall conclusion probably was more a result of Brew moving into administration, being burdened by Awadavi. Never really published a lot on Awadavi. It was Watt Smith who published Ceramics from the Western Mound. Uh, and there were other publications, but not by Brew, because he was totally consumed by administration. Bullard became a Mesoamerican archaeologist. Assistant director died young. Daifuku joined the UN. So students did not continue in the Southwest, did not continue with that controversy. And they could not, I think, compete with the overwhelming publication of Paul Martin and John Rinaldo, who did not have academic positions and did not go to faculty meetings, which I went to today. <laughs> so I could just do research, which is the beauty of Gila Pueblo, as we've often talked before. That's why I think Harris was so incredibly productive from 1930 to 1937. He did not have a bureaucracy, an academic bureaucracy to deal with. Now, when he became head of the department, the department was, what, four people? Let's see, there's a photograph of them in 43. The department and the museum was six people, four in the photograph and two were at war. But there were four people in the department and the museum in 1943. I think it's either four or five. Now we are 52. That's quite a change. So Howry, although he moved into administration, used that in order to promote his own research agenda. Papagoria, Forestdale, Point of Pines, the minute Joe Ben Wheat solved it in 1955, I think Howry backed out of Point of Pines. It became more something that Ray Thompson was involved in. He went back to the Hohokam, as I said earlier. So in 64, 65, it's Snake Town 2. Yeah, I think they were on a number of uh, National Park Committees, CRAR, and uh, no, Brew became a major international resource conservator protector, and in the obituary that we did for him, it is quite clear, I think, that that's where he devoted his energies mm -hmm. throughout the 50s, and certainly the 60s.
Okay. Yes, I, was, I have two questions. Uh, when the ancestral Pueblo in the form of the Kayenta people moved into the Mogollon Rim, was the four mile polychrome a direct result of the design and style of the Maverick Mountain, the general type? No. Okay, and then question two would be, uh, who come up with the Gila polychrome series? Was that the Mogollon or the ancestral Pueblo in, in uh, relationship with each other in cooperation to come up with this spectacular pottery that nobody had ever seen anything like it. Roosevelt Redware is a technology that was adapted by different people. <clears throat> I'm going to give you my interpretation. The technology is low fire, so it was a good way to produce polychromes in a fuel scarce environment because it's low fire as opposed to say jetito which they're surrounded by coal so that you can get a very hot fire and keep it hot and a number of other areas not the mountains the mountains has enough fuel but in other areas i would argue that the performance characteristics of a low fire ceramic are very important it has to be low fire, not only because of a fuel scarce environment, because you're using a carbon paint. And if you have a high fire, then you're gonna burn off the black, the carbon black. And the Thornburgs have demonstrated that very property in their reproductions of Roosevelt Redware. Now you find Roosevelt Redware in a number of styles some of which come out of the White Mountain Redware stylistic tradition, and others come out of the Chihuahuan stylistic tradition, I would argue. Thank you. It goes back to earlier, say, Pinto, black on red, Pinto polychrome. There's a direct genealogical relationship in the styles that go from Pinedale style to Four Mile style. Thank you. Uh, we have another question about um, sort of the cultural groupings. Um, we've talked about the Hohokam, the Mogollon, mm -hmm. the Ancestral Puebloans. Um, where did the Sanagua fit in, in this in this sequence and the relationships? I wish Harold Colton were here. <laughs> <clears throat> he defined the Sanawa, of course. He saw them as closely related to the Mugion, but they're in an intermediate position. They're in a frontier type zone. And a number of people in that sort of intermediate position are gonna have characteristics of many different groups. Recent work by Chris Downham and his colleagues is seeing that they're in say the San Francisco Peaks area, you have a coming together of uh, Tucson ceramics or ancestral Pueblo group, Cojonina ceramics and a Cojonina ethnic group they think is different. And then of course the Sanawa, which they see is more closely related to the Mogollon. So what has been called Sanawa by a lot of folks can be seen as in many cases a mixture. Take Wapatki, for example. Wapatki has a number of very unusual characteristics. Ball courts, great kiva. They call it an amphitheater. It's a great kiva. <clears throat> uh, more macaws than Pueblo Benito. 41 macaws from Wapatki. Something's going on there. Has a spring has a blowhole, those of you who have been to Wapaki know that has a blowhole that depending upon atmospheric conditions either blows air out at an amazing velocity or sucks air in at a similar velocity. So there's some unusual things going on there that uh, make that Sanawa site stand out as being probably, again, multi-use. And we await the final report on that one. But again, I would, 
I would see Sanawa in terms of the Alameda Brown wares as being essentially something closely related to what's going on in the mountains, kind of a mountain people, because they're right there in the mountains. Okay, any other questions? Well, I'll, I'll leave you with one more. Um, okay. Given your perspective um, on, on the history of archaeology in the Southwest, um, where do you see Southwestern archaeology going now? Um, Emil Howery had so much room to move. <clears throat> What's, what, what do you, where do you see us going from this point forward? Wow. There, there are a number of issues, I think, that confront us. And the first is looking at existing collections again. There's a lot of stuff that has not been written up. <clears throat> Steve Nash has looked at the Field Museum collections and has made a list of all that Paul Martin and John Rinaldo did not do. So there's a lot to do in the Field Museum. There's probably much to do in other museums. Nash has moved to what is not now the Denver Natural History Museum, but Denver became the Nature and Science. Nature and Science. <clears throat> uh, and is touting the overall value it, as at looking at these old collections. Um, their old archives, John Welch is looking at the Kanishpa materials, both in terms of archives and reanalysis of archival and artifactual materials. So I see that as probably number one. Uh, second is going to be involvement in preservation. Uh, preservation is very important. Conserving resources that are coming under attack. Uh, and I think part of that has got to be the recognition that Southwestern archaeology is not simply Native Americans. Archaeology, because I teach historical archaeology as well, includes a Spanish colonial occupation uh, a Mexican occupation and an Anglo occupation that is very rich here in, in Tucson specifically. So that archaeology, I think, has a real debt to broaden its perspective. And those of us who claim to be behavioral archaeologists see that modern material culture is also very important. So historical archaeology with many ethnic groups, I think is important. Modern material culture, the history of technology is something that Schiffer is working on. I think that also is important. I think there would be much less in the way of large excavation projects simply because they're unaffordable. And agencies are not willing to shell out the money for those very large projects. I would be very surprised if we had any of the large projects. We will see. I don't know. Dams? I don't know. Concrete rivers like CAP? I don't know. They don't consult with me. But it's my feeling that these large projects, even if we go full blast into infrastructure renewal, are not going to mimic what we've seen in the past. That's off the top of the head. All righty. Well, Jeff, thank you very much. Thank you. Very attentive. <laughs>